hundred years ago, steam engines carried freight and passengers across continents with remarkable efficiency. But how did engineers transform basic steam into such reliable motion? This is how vintage locomotives really worked. At the very center of every steam locomotive sits its heart, the boiler. Imagine a massive tank filled almost to the brim with water sitting above a raging inferno. Beneath the boiler in what's called the firebox, coal is shoveled in by hand and burned at temperatures hot enough to turn metal cherry red. But here's the twist. The heat doesn't just rise up and disappear. Instead, it travels through hundreds of metal tubes called fire tubes that run right through the water. As these tubes heat up, the water surrounding them begins to boil furiously and steam starts to collect at the highest point of the boiler in a distinctive dome that gave many locomotives their iconic silhouette. Now you might think shoveling coal is just mindless labor, but you'd be dead wrong. The firemen who worked these engines developed an almost artistic technique, tilting their shovels at precisely the right angle so each lump of coal landed evenly across the grates. Now, this wasn't just for show. An uneven fire meant uneven steam production, which could mean the difference between making it up a steep grade or stalling halfway up with a thousand tons of freight behind you. Once the steam is created, the real transformation begins. This high pressure steam, trapped in the boiler under immense force, travels down a main pipe controlled by the throttle. The engineer in the cab holds this power in his hands, quite literally, because opening that throttle sends the steam rushing into a pair of cylinders located near the front wheels. Inside these cylinders, something remarkable happens. The steam enters alternately on each side of a piston, pushing it back and forth with tremendous force. This is where fire and water become motion. The pistons are connected to rods, and those rods are connected to cranks attached to the massive driving wheels. As the pistons push and pull, the wheels begin to turn, and suddenly, all that contained energy is translated into the forward momentum that can pull trains weighing thousands of tons. But here's a brilliant detail that the engineers figured out early on. The pistons on each side are always 90 degrees out of phase with each other. Why does this matter? Because it means the locomotive almost never gets stuck at what's called dead center, where neither piston could produce any push or pull. One piston is always in a position to move the engine forward, a simple solution to what could have been a deal-breaking problem. But wait, here's something that's gonna blow your mind. These locomotives were essentially traveling bombs with boilers holding steam at pressures that could reach 200 pounds per square inch or more, temperatures hot enough to instantly scald anyone nearby, and fires burning at over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So how did they prevent these machines from exploding and killing everyone aboard? How did engineers over 100 years ago build in enough safety measures to make these locomotives reliable enough for daily passenger service, trusted by millions of people who rode them without a second thought about the tremendous forces contained just feet away from their seats? The answer lies in a series of ingenious safety systems that work together like a safety net made of iron and steam. First, there were safety valves, spring-loaded devices that would automatically vent excess steam if the pressure inside the boiler climbed too high. These weren't optional extras, they were the difference between life and death. Then, there were sight glasses, simple glass tubes that showed the water level inside the boiler. If that level dropped too low, the metal crown sheet at the top of the firebox could overheat and fail catastrophically, causing the kind of boiler explosion that could destroy an entire locomotive and kill everyone nearby. Engineers and firemen checked these sight glasses constantly, more often than you'd check your fuel gauge while driving. But the engineers didn't stop there. They also had to solve another puzzle, how to constantly replace the water that was being turned into steam and exhausted out of the system. The solution was devices called injectors, clever contraptions that used steam pressure itself to force fresh water back into the boiler. Some locomotives even recycled exhaust steam from the cylinders to power these injectors, squeezing efficiency out of every possible source. And for the truly ambitious runs, some engines had scoops mounted under their tenders that could dip down into specially designed water troughs placed between the rails. 
allowing the locomotive to refill its water supply while traveling at full speed. Now let's talk about that sound, that iconic chuff 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 that everyone associates with steam trains. That's not just noise, that's the locomotive breathing after the steam does its work pushing the pistons. It has to go somewhere. Instead of just venting it randomly, the engineers routed it up through the smokestack, the chimney at the front of the engine. Here's the brilliant part. As that exhaust steam blasts up the chimney, it creates a powerful draft that pulls hot gases from the fire through all those fire tubes and out of the boiler. This draft intensifies the fire, which makes more steam, which powers more strokes, which creates more exhaust, which intensifies the fire even more. It's a self-reinforcing cycle of power. The rhythm and intensity of that chuff sound was directly linked to the locomotive's speed. At slow speeds, you'd hear distinct, separate chuffs, four beats per revolution of the driving wheels. But as the engine picked up speed, those chuffs came faster and faster, until they merged into a continuous roar, a thunderous declaration of raw mechanical power that could be heard for miles. Experienced railroad workers could identify specific locomotives just by the sound of their exhaust, like recognizing a friend's voice in a crowd. Steam wasn't just used for moving the locomotive though, it was the universal power source for everything on board, the whistle. That haunting call that warned of the train's approach was powered by steam. The brakes operated through steam-driven air pumps that compressed air for the entire train's braking system ran on steam. Even the heating systems for passenger cars in winter drew their warmth from steam piped back from the locomotive. Some engines even had steam-powered generators called dynamos that produced electricity for headlights and interior lighting long before electrical grids were common. These locomotives were complete mobile power plants. Speaking of control, how did Victorian era engineers, without computers or electronic controls, create a system sophisticated enough to give an operator that kind of precise control over such a powerful machine? The answer is something called the valve gear, and it's one of the most elegant pieces of mechanical engineering ever devised. The valve gear is a complex assembly of rods, levers, and eccentrics, basically off-center wheels that control the timing of steam admission to the cylinders. By moving a lever in the cab, the engineer could adjust how long the steam was admitted, when it was cut off, and even reverse the entire timing to make the locomotive run backwards. It's like a mechanical computer, purely analog, purely mechanical, but capable of incredibly precise control. Skilled engineers could adjust the cutoff point the moment when steam admission stopped and the piston continued to move using the steam's expansion to match the load and conditions perfectly. Starting a heavy freight train required admitting steam for a longer portion of the stroke to get maximum torque. But once rolling, they'd shorten the cutoff to let the steam expand more using less steam for each stroke and dramatically improving fuel economy. Running a steam locomotive required massive amounts of resources. A large locomotive could consume thousands of gallons of water and several tons of coal on a single run between cities. This need shaped entire railway systems, determining where water towers and coaling stations would be built, and often determining which towns grew and which didn't. In arid regions like the Australian Outback or South Africa, Locomotives hauled enormous tenders or even additional water cars just to make the journey between far-spaced watering points. But perhaps the most important component of any steam locomotive wasn't made of metal at all. Inside the cab, the engineer and fireman worked as a team amid heat, noise, and constant vibration. The fireman's job was to maintain that even hot fire we talked about, reading the steam pressure gauge and adjusting his firing rate to match the demands the engineer was placing on the engine. The engineer monitored a dozen instruments, managed speed, anticipated grades and stops, and communicated with the conductor and brakeman through whistle signals and hand gestures. Steam technology never stopped evolving though. Engineers constantly experimented with innovations to squeeze more efficiency and power from the basic design. Superheaters, which dried and further heated the steam before it entered the cylinders, dramatically improved fuel economy and power output. Some experimental locomotives tried water tube boilers, turbines instead of pistons, 
multiple boilers, or streamlined casings that made them look like rockets on rails. There were even condensing locomotives designed for use in long tunnels, where exhaust steam was condensed back to water instead of being vented, preventing the cab from filling with choking smoke and steam. And here's a detail that shows how practical and clever these engineers were. Many locomotives had sanding boxes mounted above the driving wheels. These dispensed sand directly onto the rails in front of the wheels when traction was needed on slippery tracks. Rain, ice, autumn leaves, even morning dew could make iron wheels slip on iron rails. A little sand at the right moment could mean the difference between pulling a train up a grade or spinning wheels uselessly. The era of steam locomotives eventually ended, replaced by diesel and electric power that was cleaner, more efficient, and required less manual labor. But the impact these machines had on the world cannot be overstated. They transformed human civilization, making journeys that once took months possible in days. They fueled industrial expansion, connected continents, and quite literally shaped the modern world. So here's my question for you. If you could take one ride on any historic steam locomotive, traveling through any landscape at any point in history, which one would you choose and why? Would you pick the Orient Express steaming across Europe? Or the big boy hauling freight over the Rockies? Drop your answer in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into the engineering marvels of the Steam Age, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. We've got more fascinating explorations coming your way.